What's up, everyone? Welcome to Unmasked, where things are discovered, uncovered, brought to the light, and made known. I'm your host, Lamar Barrett, coming live to you from PG County, Maryland. If you're interested in finding out about the untold stories behind being a college coach, this is the show for you. Being a former assistant men's college basketball coach for 16 years, there are so many untold stories behind the scenes in the life of a college basketball coach. Now, let's unmask them. Today's guest is a longtime assistant coach with a great basketball mind, excellent talent evaluator. He was actually just named this July, you know, uh, a month ago, not even a month ago, as the number one MAC, and that's the Metro Atlantic Athletic Conference, uh, number one assistant in the conference. So that's a big uh, feat, you know, uh, being named by your peers more than anything. Um, and, and it's a guy who I think is a future head coach uh, in this business. He's, um, you know, he's the first assistant coach of Indian um, descent to be named, um, you know, in, 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 in Division One basketball. And that's almost, that's 10 years ago now. Well, he's been a Division One assistant for, um, you know, he's been in the business longer than that. But as an assistant coach, 10 years now uh, in the business. Uh, and he's a native of North Brunswick, New Jersey. Uh, North Brunswick, New Jersey. I want to welcome to the show, Delete Batia. And then uh, I would read a little bit about his bio. I mean, you know, he, he has a uh, interesting uh, story and uh, how he started and where he's gotten to. So he graduated from Rutgers University in 2005. And once he graduated, um, you know, from college, he went right into the business world. Was working at Deloitte, um, where he spent two years there and. And he also was, at the same time, a volunteer assistant coach uh, at, his, uh, at his old high school, at North Brunswick High School, uh, where he did a great job there for the two years he was there. And then he gets an assistant coaching job at Kane College uh, in New Jersey. And uh, after spending, there, been spending time there for a year, he goes on to St. Peter's University, and he works his first step with John Donner. So, you know, that was 2008 to 2013, two years he spent as a director of basketball ops uh, for three years there. He's been as assistant coach. Then he goes to his alma mater. That had to be, you know, a dream come true to go back to your alma mater where you went to school. Uh, he was there from 2013 to 2016 where he had a chance to be the director of basketball ops for two years. And, and then his, you know, last year there at Rutgers, he's an assistant coach. He gets named as an assistant coach, which definitely had to be a dream come true. Um, you know, then he takes a development year, a personal development year, and, um, you know, professional development, as we say in this business, and kind of work on some things with yourself uh, from, from a basketball standpoint. And then he gets a chance to get reunited with John Don at St. Peter's uh, for one season as an assistant coach. And then uh, John Don gets the head job at Maris. He goes along with John Don to Maris, and he's been there for two years, ready to go on year three. And, this is a guy I've gotten to know, or know over the years. We hung out at the um, Final Four a couple of times and, you know, had a couple of, um, you know, lunches and dinners. Uh, and uh, we, we, we have some friends in common. I just want to say welcome to the show, Delete. Lamar, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I appreciate the kind words and, and that long bio. Um, but, uh, yeah, grateful that you uh, invited me on your show. Um, great to see some of the things you're doing on your own platform. Um, you know, after being in the business so long and, uh, you know, just glad that you and I had become friends over the years, uh, just through our mutual friends and, you know, just, just learning about your background and, and just growing our friendship and seeing all the success you had as an assistant. And, uh, you know, it's sometimes, sometimes funny that we, we study fellow assistants from afar without knowing them. And, uh, we try to emulate certain things and, um, you know, I'm glad we had so many mutual friends in common and, you know, we got to spend time together at the final four and hang out and, and just uh, learning from you from afar and um, excited to be on your show. So thanks again for having me. Hey man, thanks for those kind words, man. And uh, like, like you said, like, and then we're on zoom together and, you know, we, so we, we, we somehow we're always connected, which is a plus, um, you know, I, I want to still, and I want to say congrats to be named by your peers uh, as the best assistant coach in the MAC, that's well deserved, um, and I and I think you know when people think highly of you, um, that's a plus, man. Like especially guys that that you work with all year long or have been working with for years. So 
Uh, I'm going to say congratulations again. But we will get right to it, man. We're going to get unmasked. You know, you, you've been in it. You've seen a lot. So I want you to be able to, you know, sit, tell some things that you've seen or kind of even your story is going to be intertwined in this. But, I mean, we all know, uh, Delete, there's no handbook, man, to being a college coach. Uh, tell me about your first day, first week, first month, um, after things are done with human resources or, or, or orientation, uh, especially no one gives you direction. That's whether you were at, um, you know, Kane College when you were, you know, first getting in uh, until – or even when you first went to St. Peter's. But talk about that, man, That's that experience. Sure, sure. You know, I, I'll be the first to admit, when I got in, I was so green. I, I had no clue what to expect. I didn't know anything. Um, I was just grateful to have an opportunity and you walking in in, a, in, a, in an environment where you have no idea what to expect. You know, I didn't play division one collegiate basketball. So I was never around that, you know, um, environment at that high level. So everything for me was a learning, learning curve. And, um, you know, obviously each of the, each of the stops that I've had at different colleges and university were, were unique. Um, but, you know, the first, I'll, t I'll talk about the first day at St. Peter's. Uh, when I got there on my first day, you know, um, Coach Dunn hired me as the director of operations. And, you know, you go into the office, you meet, you meet, you know, the, the rest of the staff. And I got to work with some wonderful people over there um, that, that were just key in helping me, you know, adapt and, and make sure that I had success. Um, but I still remember the first day. You know, um, after after meeting with Coach Dunn and just getting situated in the office and and uh, hanging out with the rest of the guys on the staff, um, he gave me my first project literally on my first day after like two or three hours, and uh, I was so excited and gung ho. And you know, he told me that uh, the season had just ended. It was um, I think it was March, April of two thousand eight, and uh, they had a talented core of of good young freshman. So he, he had asked me to make a shot at it of every returning player shot. Right. And he wanted to watch it with each, each player one-on-one. -on -one. So I was so excited and I had no clue how to do it. So uh, he was like, Oh, there's some VCRs over there. And, and uh, you know, the, the, the rest of the guys on staff will help you figure it out. So um you know, I sat at my desk and there was two VCRs there. And I think I stared at the VCRs probably for like 30 minutes. Just wondering, how do I even start this project? Like, I don't even know. And, um, you know, it, it's so funny because, um, you know, when I grew up, we, we, we weren't fortunate to have a VCR in our house. So I didn't have that luxury of like knowing how to work the wires and, and how to plug things in and and now, now there's two of them on my desk. So I was staring at it and, and I had no clue how to do it. Um, that was my first task. And, you know, I, I was embarrassed to ask for help right away. But finally, you know, I went up to one of my colleagues and, and uh, James Wallace, who I worked with, who's, you know, who's no longer in the business. He, uh, I just asked him how to set the VCRs up. So he had gotten me started and, um, you know, and, and I just started away. And that, that was my first task. And it was overwhelming, just because, you know, you're playing with VCRs, you're playing with two remotes, and, and you're trying to watch the film and make an edit. And it was, uh, I thought I was doing it all wrong. Every day I went home asking myself, man, did I even do anything correct? And uh, so I, I worked on that project for like one or two months, and finally it was done. And I gave it to coach. And I was nervous giving it giving him a, a VCR tape with a whole bunch of shots on it. And um, I was worried the screen was going to go black during the middle of the edit and whatnot. So I gave him a whole bunch of tapes and he watched it. And, um, you know, he really, he really didn't have uh, many errors in there. So I was just grateful because I was so nervous that I was going to give him, you know, eight, nine v VHS tapes of, of, of each player. And it, it was going to be a train wreck and I was going to get fired after two months. So, um, but that was my first day, and, and like I said, I was just grateful that I worked with some really good people over the years at St. Peter's, and, um, you know, when I first got there, you know, James Wallace and John Morton, um, James is out of the business now, but John Morton's an assistant at St. Peter's now, and uh, those guys just, you know, they 
they, they, they looked out for me and, and uh, we've remained friends on, you know, over the years. And um, those are two of my good friends. So uh, grateful that, that, that they, you know, allowed me to be a part of their staff and, and welcome me in with open arms. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. VCRs, man. You know what? It seemed like ages, ages ago, like, you like VCR, what's that now? But having, I, I, you bring it back memories like you having two VCRs and like you exchanging take man that was I mean that seems so long ago but it, it wasn't that long ago that's that's the crazy thing about it um recruiting we all know that's the lifeline of college athletics man like um you got to get good players got to get good people to win um you've had success when you were at St. Peter's um you know you were at Rutgers now you're at Maris, you know, you, you went back to St. Peter's, but now you're at Maris trying to turn that program around. It's, it's been down, and I know you guys are going to do it. Coach John, John Dunn is a terrific coach. you got great coaching staff. Um, talk about, like, recruiting. What's your best and worst recruiting stories? I know we were talking about, you know, one off the air, but, like, think about all of, over the years. Like, what's been your best and worst recruiting stories? Yeah, you know, that's so – it's such a unique question because I think every, every recruiting, every, every young man that you recruit has its own story behind it. And, you know, the, the hurdles you face and, and the surprises along the way. So, um, you know, I, I'd say the best one w w would probably have to be a um, kid I recruited at St. Peter's in uh, 2000, I think the summer of 2012, right? Summer of 2012, the year before I went to Rutgers, um, we, we were recruiting a kid in, in Philly, um, more than happy to share his name, Quadir Welton. He was from uh, math, civics, and sciences. So, uh, you know, uh, recruited him during his junior year. And, um, you know, we, he, he was the first person to ever commit to coach Dunn during his junior year. And, and, getting kids to commit at that time at St. Peter's University during their junior, during their senior year was, was hard enough. And to get one during their junior year was, was a pleasant surprise. And, uh, you know, he committed in the spring of his, of his junior year. And, um, you know, when he went to play AAU, he, he, he had a lot of success and, and there was chirping that he could go at a higher level and Atlantic 10 schools were looking at him and, and all that. So, um, right before the live period, uh, I think it was the last week of June, he, he called and he decommitted and, um, decommitted the last week of June. And, you know, I was, I was, I was stressed and, you know, walk in your boss's office and tell him that, you know, his, his future center is decommitting. And so I was, I was, I was hesitant to do that, but obviously you gotta, you gotta have that conversation. And so, um, we're all surprised, but, uh, it's part of the game. And, um, you know, a week goes by and we're trying to put together our travel plans for July. And uh, my fellow colleague at the time, uh, Marlon Gill, who's one of my closest friends, he was, he was my colleague at the time. And he was like, yeah, you got to keep recruiting Quadir. And, and I was a little sour on the situation. I put so much time into it. And he was like, you can't give up. You got to go get that kid. So, um his AU team was playing a tournament, uh, uh, one of the one of the three live periods in in Milwaukee that year. So uh, we were putting together our travel plan. So you know, I I asked Coach Dunn, hey, I, I want to go to Milwaukee for that whole stretch, and and uh, he 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 was he was awesome. He was like, go for it, let's try to get him. Um, but I was a little nervous because we didn't have you know a great budget there, and here I am asking to spend four or five days in Milwaukee to chase one kid who had just decommitted. So, um, you know, I went out there for five days and, you know, literally watched, watched every game was, was just trying to be visible with them. And, um, you know, and, and I'd call back and I'd call Marlon who was in like in Atlanta or, 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 or at the hoop group tournament. And I'd be like, Hey man, I think I'm wasting my time. I'm nervous. I just spent all this money coming to Milwaukee and, and, and we're about, if we don't get this kid, man, coach Dunn going to yell at me spending all this money. And Marlon, Marlon was just like, he hung up the phone on me. He was like, no, nah, you just got to go get that done, man. So um, black period ended and, uh, you know, uh, August 1st came. And that's, I think that was the time where you could do the, yeah, you could do like the unofficial visits again. And so black period ended, called him on August 1 and, you know, just let him know, hey man, like we're all in and, and uh, 
we want you. And if, if, if you don't want to be a part of it, then, then we're going to move on. And uh, literally 24 hours later, he called and recommitted. Um, I was just so happy because I was nervous. I was going to get fired, you know, I just went and invested all this money from our budget to go spend five days. And um, so he recommitted, I think, August 2nd or August 1st or 2nd. And um, so um, it, it was a cool experience just getting to know him and his family and, and to see the emotional roller coaster of a kid, you, you know, you really like. And he commits, he decommits, and then he recommits. And then um, Quadir and I obviously, you know, have a good relationship to this day. Um, but at the end of the year, I actually left and, uh, you know, went on to work at Rutgers the following year. So I never got to coach Quadir. Um, I recruited him, but didn't coach him. And he went on to become a, a first team all Mac player senior year. So just happy for his success as a kid and, and, you know, his development over four or five years and just had a strong, strong work ethic. And he was a really high character kid. So it was just great to see his success. So, um, that, that was a pretty cool story. Definitely, definitely was, man. Definitely. That, that's an up and down. So that that was a that was a good, bad, back to good. So yeah. I, I love that story, man. Like like, um, you know, we all, you know, as college coaches, man, you so much time you invest because um, it's it's recruiting, it's the uh, you know scouting. You know, you got to watch film. Um, you deal with the kids like all the time. So, you know, I tell people, man, like we people always ask, when is your downtime? It, there's no downtime in college athletics. Like we don't get vacations like everyone else do and, and things of that nature. We don't get to spend a lot of time, you know, like you can't plan stuff with your friends. You know how it is in this business. Yeah. You can never really plan anything during the season. But like what did you have to give up or achieve or give up or either sacrifice to uh, – achieving your current level of success, like just being where you are now in college basketball? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think, you know, there, there's a lot of sacrifices we all have to make in this business. And, um, you know, it's a lot of common sacrifices amongst, amongst you know, all the coaches. Um, and then there's some, you know, different ones for each person. Um, obviously, you give up a lot of time for your friends, your family, and, and um, you know, being at, being at the – call of a whim if situation arises um you feel like you're on call um but you know I think uh you give up that social aspect a lot you know um plans being interrupted um it's hard to sometimes plan advance in, in advance um if you want to do certain things with your friends and all that kind of stuff um but obviously you know I think the one thing I, I've definitely sacrificed is uh you know uh, probably uh, like all of us is probably more monetary success at a younger age. Um, you know, I, I was fortunate to work uh, in the business world after graduating college and saw more money than I ever saw when I was a kid. So to have, you know, just have them disposable income when you're 23, 24 years old and, you know, you didn't get to have that when maybe when you were in your teens or, or, or early years. So um probably just cool to have like a hundred, two hundred dollars in your pocket when you're 23, 24. Um, and then when you get into coaching, I think we all sacrifice that, that, uh, opportunity to have money now, as opposed to later in, in, in your career. Um, so I think that's one thing I, I definitely have to sacrifice because, you know, if, if I continued on that path when I was 23, 24 and didn't, you know, get into college coaching, um, my career could have went different ways from a professional business standpoint. So I'd say that's probably the biggest thing I've, I've, I've sacrificed is just that, uh, the monetary, the, the monetary value. So true, man. I, I understand. Like you, I mean, you were working at a top, top company, man. So I, I, I feel you on that one. Like your path could have been different, but you know what? You chose to be happy in your passion and, and that's what it's about. Like, you know, it, and, and, you, you, you get rewarded more because of, you know, not we'll talk about that later on. It's like just seeing the kids that you recruit or you had a chance to coach, you know, when they graduate and how successful they become. But um, talk about, you know, scout reports, man. Like that, that's a huge part too. We talk about recruiting. We talk about the scouting. Um, you know, a lot of times you do your best job of 
you know, knowing the actions, knowing the play calls, you know, you got the personnel down pack. Guys still go out and really don't perform. And because a lot of times we look at it, the, the leap, and it's like we watch seven, eight, nine games. And we know everything about the team. But then we give, like, little highlights to the players and expect them to know everything and forget that they got other things to go on. Um, but saying that, like, we still try to prepare them to be successful to win games. That's, I mean, that's what it's about. Um, but then there's also times that you have that guy who two for his last 30 from three, he's struggling. You tell coach, well, you know, he's struggling from shooting. All coach, he thought you said he, he, he's not a shooter. And now he – coach is turning to you during the game. He done made three or four threes in a row. Coach is chewing you out. Using, um, using some words that, you know, just some choice words that, you know, you don't like to hear. But talk about, like, the scouting. Like, what's the best and worst job scouting report-wise? Or And I don't have to be a specific game, but, like, talk about that. Like, the best and worst scouting report. Oh, that, that's a that's an interesting question. I think the biggest thing I've learned in scouting is is probably over the years is just choose your words carefully with your head coach when you – when you're presenting in, in preparation of a game, like, you know, head coaches have so much on their plate on a daily basis. So, you know, they're, they, they take what their assistants say, you know, um, very precisely. So you don't want to send mixed mi messages to your boss and, and uh, you know, just learn that over the years from so many mistakes, probably when I was a younger assistant and, and just got to be more thoughtful a, a, as you grow in your profession. But um I'd say, my, you know, I think every scout, you're just nervous because you want to do a good job for your boss and you want to help the guys on the team, right? Like you see they, they work so hard on a daily basis and you just develop these strong personal relationships with the guys on the team and you just want to see them get rewarded. So, you know, when, when you prepare for a game, you just want to make sure that you, you put in your honest days of work because you want to see the kids succeed. Um, so I, I – to answer your question, Lamar, the, the, the worst scout was probably my first one. I was just so nervous. And, and, you know, when you get an opportunity to present to a team and, you know, your boss is asking you a million questions and things are going a million miles an hour, and it's, it's like anything else you do for the first time in your life. Like, until you have that experience, it's just so hard, right? So I think at first, the first scout I ever had was uh, uh, 2010. Uh, we opened up at Robert Morris and, uh, you know, uh, coach Dunn is, is very specific on matchups and, um, you know, so after jump ball, there was a foul right after jump ball. So one of our better players picked up a foul, like literally one or two seconds into the game and matchups got changed. And, you know, he's looking at me, asking me questions, and I'm changing matchups. And I was, it's already two seconds into the game. I'm feeling overwhelmed, feeling stressed. And, um, you know, we, we, I think we had one field goal in the whole first half, and we couldn't put the ball in the bucket. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think we only, we, we, we were held to like 30 something points that game. And after the game, I just remember I was like, am I even cut out to do this? You know, like I felt so bad. Like I felt like I let people down. And um, so th that, that was probably the worst one because you lose and you take it personally. And it was my first scout. And, you know, you see the disappointment on, 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 on your boss's face or you see the disappointment in the guys in the locker room. And we just got blitzed that day um, at Robert Morris and, and that was opening night. So, um, and then you have that six hour bus ride back to New Jersey and you sitting on the, on the bus and you don't want to say one word. You just want to sit there in silence. And uh, so that wasn't, that wasn't a, that wasn't a fun experience, but you learn over time, you know, it's uh, you grow and you develop and you learn from your, your experiences. So that was probably the worst one. Cause you just, you just feel like you weren't cut, you know, you're not cut out to do it and you question yourself and, and, you, and your, and your skill set. So uh, that, that I would say that one um, regarding the best one, I think it's just anytime you win a game and you help your guys. I mean, I think that's just the most, that's just a, that's just a good feeling to have after the game's over and the buzzer buzzer sounds and you could celebrate with your, 
with your fellow colleagues and, and, and your, and your players. Um, but I think anytime, I think anytime you, you have to do a Manhattan Jasper scout is always, is always a good one just because uh, uh, I think, you know, coach Massiello, he, he runs a lot of great actions. Um, he's got so many counters to all of his own plays. So that's, that, that's a challenging scout in itself. So anytime, you know, you, you do the, the Manhattan scout, I think, I think uh, it's always a good scout till you get to, till, till you get to the game and the jump ball goes in and, and their pressure defense comes in. But I think that's like a challenging, uh, definitely a challenging game to prepare for. And, and, and cause not only do you have to prepare for their, their offense, you also have to prepare for their defense. So that, that can take a toll on you as to prepare. And like you mentioned earlier, like you want to limit the amount of stuff you share with your players to, to make sure that they're, you know, not only comprehending, but remembering what are, what are the keys along to the game. So uh, I don't know what's, what's my best scout, but I would say anytime you can get through a Manhattan Jasper scout and, and come out with a victory, that, that's always, uh, always a big plus because those guys do a great job. I, I totally agree with you. So I, I've been through many of those Manhattan, the, 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 the matchup zone or whatever you want to call it, or me, but whatever they want to call it. I mean, I, trust me, I, I agree with you 100% on that. I agree with you. Um, what's the biggest challenge, man, you think you've experienced since you, you know, become a college coach? What's the biggest challenge? I mean, I think every day is a challenge and for all of us. Um, you know, we all have our own respective hurdles we face, you know, as a professional. Um, for me, I think it's just been uh, just my ethnicity. I mean, I think it's um, – there aren't a lot of people that look like me in our profession. So it's, uh, it's, always, it's always, you know, a little different when you walk into a room and, and you don't see many people like yourself. Um, so that's always – probably been a biggest challenge when I think when I was younger, I let it get to me a little bit more. Um, and as I've grown and matured and just become more experienced, you, you try to take the positives out of every situation, you know, and, and um, just having an opportunity to, you know, be, be a college basketball coach and represent my, my, my heritage and my ethnicity, you know, I take that very, very seriously. So I know all the hurdles have come, come along with that and, maybe some misperceptions or stereotypes that come along with, um, you know, people of my background and, and you just try to alleviate that a little bit, but, you know, I've learned you can't just be always worried about what other people think. Um, and I think when we're all younger, you know, in, in, in our careers, uh, you try to combat that a little bit, but as you mature and, and you get older, you get more wiser, you know, you can't be worried about what people think and the stereotypes and, and you know, hopefully, you know, and, and with all that's going on in our world today, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a unique time. And, um, you know, there, there, it's, it's a, there's a lot of sad state of affairs going on. And um, a lot, uh, hopefully we can come out of, you know, these times with a more positive outlook on life, on people and, you know, just so much racism and discrimination going on in our world. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's a unique set of circumstances, but I think we have to just try to improve as, as individuals, you know, and our outlook on life. Um, so I've just tried to, tried to understand that, that, you know, there, I'm a unique person in our business for, for a specific set of circumstances. And, uh, you can't control what other people think about you. Um, I think, you know, to be a fully, fully transparent, I think I used to let it bother me when I was younger in the profession and um, you try to fight stereotypes and all that. But, uh, you know, over time, you just, you realize all you can do is, you know, show up, do a good job and, and, you know, remember why you got into the business. Right. And that's to, you know, be around student athletes and, and care for them and, and see them grow. And um, as long as I get to do that, I'm, you know, I'm happy. Awesome. Awesome answer right there. Um, like, what do you try to teach your players besides basketball? Because, I mean, this is a education. We're still in education. We're still in teaching. But, like, what, what do you try to teach those guys besides basketball? You know, I think 
sometimes as coaches, we're, we're so gung ho on teaching them. And I think sometimes we have to realize that we can also learn from them, right? Like we, we're teachers, we're educators, but um, I'm just a big proponent in life that you can learn from everyone, regardless of your education level and your experience and your, you know, your work experience and your years in a, in a position, uh, we can learn from everybody. So um, I, I like learning from our guys every day, you know, um, and, and, I, and I'm excited that I get to teach them something um, outside of basketball as well, right? And um, if they don't know you care for them, they're not going to listen to anything that you have to say. So uh, the one thing I just try to encourage, and I, I don't want to use the word teach because uh, I think they've been taught their whole life, you know, how to be good character people. And it's just something I just try to emphasize, reemphasize on a daily basis is just maintain a certain level of character and integrity in everything that you do, you know, and try to help them understand that every decision they have in life, there's consequences too. Um, so never, never take any decision in life lightly because you don't know the ramifications it could have over a course of days, months, or years. But, um, you know, I just try to, I just try to make sure that they understand, you know, how to be a high character person, and never, never compromise their values um, of who they are as people. And I think that's just important. And um, I think I, I learn from them just as much as they learn from me every day. Awesome, man. I like. I actually like that. That's 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 a great answer right there. Um, what are your best and worst memories in coaching? Whew. That could be like a daily roller coaster right there, Lamar. <laughs> I think the highs and the lows, uh, I, I'm a pretty, I'm pretty emotional person. So, uh, you get to the highs and the lows, um, you know, over a course of 365 days. And then, you know, like you've been in this profession for so long, Lamar, there's so many countless stories in your, in your memory bank. Um, I would say, you know, the, the best was definitely, you know, winning the MAC championship in 2011 and, and going to the NCAA tournament. I mean, that was just such a memorable moment. Um, being around a group of guys who came in as freshmen, they won six games and they won 11 as sophomores, 16 as juniors, and they won 20 as seniors. And they all just stuck together. And there was just great camaraderie amongst our coaching staff, our players on a daily basis. And, you know, seeing that just all come together over a course of three, four years. That was, that was just a memorable experience. And then going to play in the NCAA tournament, you know, you're on a bus with a police escort going to play Purdue University, national TV, um, in the NCAA tournament. That was definitely the most memorable, um, memorable moment. And I'd say probably the least, you know, my least favorite memory is uh, um, an experience that most of us go through, but until you go through it, you don't know is, uh, you know, when the coaching staff gets let go. And, um, you know, when my boss, Eddie Jordan, got let go at Rutgers in 2016, um, that, that was definitely not easy. Uh, you, you know, you feel like you work so hard to achieve something and, and, you know, they tell you it's over and it just happens, you know, uh, in the span of seconds and you realize, you know, you don't work at that school anymore. So, um, you know, that, that was probably very challenging just because I went to school there. Um, that was my alma mater. I grew up eight minutes from Rutgers. So that was, that was definitely challenging. I felt, I just felt at home and, uh, you know, having the opportunity to be an assistant at the big 10 at the, at the highest level. Um, you know, and that, that's what you kind of strive for when you're a younger person in the business. So, uh, that was just definitely the most challenging, challenging time. And, uh, like I always tell somebody, you know, when, when you see, friends lose their jobs you text them and you, you reach out to console and offer help um and, and we all do it but I think you learn until you go through that experience you don't understand what somebody feels when when they lose their job you, you're, you're so right about that that uh, I agree with you 100 percent man couldn't be more right than anything um you've been around a lot you've seen a lot don't have to say names or Something you just seen, like, what's the strangest, weirdest, craziest, craziest thing, like, 
that you've seen like a player has done outside of the basketball court? Um, well, I don't know if I could share one or two stories. I might have to keep that, that offline. Um, I guess I, I talk about one of the guys I coached. Um, and I, and I learned actually from him because he, he was an international student athlete. So his family wasn't here. So he didn't, he could never just call home and, and, uh, you know, ask for money, you know, if he needed some pocket money. So he was, he was, he was very intelligent. He was smart. But one day I got a call, uh, and I'm sitting in the office and he, and he asked me to come down and I said, I thought something was wrong. So I went down to, you know, the gym floor out, met him outside and, he, uh, he, he had these tires with him. And I was like, what, what do you need help with? He was like, can you help me move these tires and, and, and put them in the locker room? I was, like, I was like, I was confused. I was like, what, what, what are we doing here? I was like, where'd you get those tires? And uh, they, were, they were four Mercedes-Benz tires. And I was just so confused and uh, – but, you know, he, he, he was, you know, uh, running like an online platform um, to try to help himself make some money, you know, buying and selling. But he had these four Mercedes-Benz tires, and here I am helping him wheel them into the, to the, to the locker room. And I was thinking to myself, I'm like, man, what, what is going on? I was like, where would you get these? I was like, you know what, I don't even want to know where you got these tires at. So, um, but he showed up with – and I'm talking about, when I'm talking about tires, they're not like bike tires. They were huge. I think they might have been bigger than me. So uh, it, it, was, uh, it was just a, uh, something funny along the way. But um, I commend him. You know, he, he was a student, student athlete who, who learned how to survive in another country. So, you know, credit goes to him. But I told him after that, don't call me anymore when you're downstairs in the parking lot with any other products. That's that's a, that's an interesting one right there. That's very interesting. Um, you, like you you work with some you know great guys, especially with uh, Coach Dunn now. Work with Eddie Jordan. You mentioned. Um, I don't think people really realize how good of a coach he was. Coach in the NBA, coach college, and um, you know you probably listened to some guys um, as of late. Like if you had a chance to sit down, pick some guys' brains, not say that you would want to go and work for somebody, but just like you want to see how they, how they tick. What do they tick? What pushes their buttons? Like who, give me like three or four guys that you would like just want to sit down with. I'll go to dinner one night and you just have a t conversation with them talking like some head coaches in the business just to pick their brain. Sure. Well, like you said, I think I've worked with, I've been fortunate to not only work with, um, work for, you know, really good people, you know, uh, division three coach I work for Rob Krasinski at Kane university, you know, John Dunn at St. Peter's and Maris and Eddie Jordan at, at, at Rutgers. Um, but I, I was fortunate to work with some really good colleagues as well, you know, fellow assistants and, 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 um, support staff that, um, I think we sometimes forget you not only learn from when you're a younger assistant, you not only learn from your, head coach, you're learning from, you know, your colleagues. That, that's where a lot of knowledge comes from. So, um, you know, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, I work, with some good, I work with some good people at Rutgers who, who, who kind of, you know, uh, were willing to share and, 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 and were, were pivotal in my growth as, as development of an assistant. You know, uh, Van Macon, who's an assistant at St. John's, um, who's going to be a head coach, who should be a head coach right now. Uh, David Cox, who's head coach at University of Rhode Island, um, Shoes Vitrone, you know, who's, who's on staff at Rutgers, uh, Bruce Hamburger, who I worked with at St. Peter's, um, but just some really good people who are just, uh, you know, they were experienced guys who, you know, showed me the ropes, and, and I always appreciated that, and uh, those guys, you know, I think they were pivotal in my development as an assistant, um, so I always value that kind of stuff. Um, but you know, if I, if I could sit down and, and, and talk with some other people and just learn, uh, one person I'd love to, to, to learn from is probably Tony Bennett at university of Virginia. Um, 
just seeing the culture that they've built at such an elite academic institution. Um, and then not only build it, but to sustain their level of success of being a, you know, a top program in the country. Um, it seems like the guys love playing for them. So would that, that would be one person I would definitely, you know, love to spend time with and, and learn from. Um, you know, I'd say another person, probably Ed Cooley at Providence. Uh, I was fortunate to uh, be at St. Peter's when he was at Fairfield and um, just thought that he, he was an outstanding coach and you could see how much his guys, his players loved him, you know, over a course of a game and he coached him hard, um, but he loved him. And uh, I think he's one of the best coaches in the country, you know, uh, I had the opportunity to study some of his stuff on film um, I think he's, I don't think he gets the credit that he deserves on a national level. Um, so that would be a second person. Um, and then um, maybe a third, uh, probably just be, you know, uh, Leonard Hamilton, just the sustained success that he's had over, over his career. I mean, I read something this morning. He's in his seventies, if I'm not mistaken. Birthday uh, was a day. Birthday. Is yeah. A day. So, uh, a take, yeah his success for, I don't know, 50, 40, 45 plus years. Um, I think we'd all just be grateful if we could be coaching in our seventies. And, and uh, so that, that would be one person I would love to pick his brain is what, what, how he's had so much sustained success over his career. So those would be three people I'd love to, to love to, you know, learn from. Three, three great guys, man. That's, those, those are interesting, all different. Um, but they're all successful. Like, I mean, that, that, that's something you can do it. It's more than, we always say, there's more than one way to skin a cat. And they've all done it different ways, and they've always they've all been successful. Not everybody has to do it the same way, so um, that's a plus. Um, what, what, and this is kind of a little different, like what movie or TV show title <laughs> might best, that best describes your week? That's such an interesting question, and I know a lot of people stumble on this one. And uh, I, I'm going to go with a, a unique answer. I'm going to go with The Pursuit of Happiness, the, the film with uh, Will, Will Smith. And uh, the reason why I think that that has a huge correlation, and, and probably not only my, my daily or weekly you know, encounters, but probably – all of, all of us as coaches, I think we all just overcome so much and uh, in, in our own unique ways and just seeing his story in that movie, how Will Smith overcame so many challenges and, and probably just the daily aspect of problem solving, you know, and if you watch the movie of the pursuit of happiness, Will Smith is just, he's just trying to overcome every obstacle on a daily basis and problem solve and you know, you're getting wrenches thrown at you from left field. And I think that's what we are as college basketball coaches. You know, we're just trying to problem solve on a daily basis. Um, so I think that's – that. I go with that one. I don't know if, if that's a good answer or not. I actually think it's a I'm great go answer. I think it's a great answer. I think that's a great answer. You, you hit that one right on the head. Like, I, I, that's a great answer. I watched that movie a couple of weeks ago, so it's fresh in my head. But just to see how – Someone who, 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 you know, who have a, who's coming from poverty and, and, and achieve this goal and uh, just, just solve problems, you know, on a daily basis. And, uh, you know, unique, like unique, he was coming up with so many unique solutions. So I think we all, I think we all encounter that. So that's what I'm going with Lamar. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, what's your favorite word or phrase you like to use? I probably use this one on a daily basis. Uh, help your teammate. I say that uh, probably multiple times a day, you know, um, amongst our, amongst our colleagues, amongst our uh, players. I just, I'm a big believer in being a good teammate. Uh, I have a very low 
tolerance level for someone who's not a good teammate. It bothers me. I, maybe it bothers me more than I should let it. But uh, I just, you know, it's like one of your earlier question, what, what do you try to help teach your players outside of basketball? I just try to encourage them to be a good teammate on a daily basis. And I think sometimes we have to help them understand what being a good teammate is. Because sometimes, you know, we all come from different walks of life and different experiences and backgrounds. Um, and, and maybe we don't all have the same understanding of what being a good teammate is. So um, I use that phrase um, every day, you know, uh, from the day, you know, uh, those kids arrive in summer school and, and to the last day of the season. And just any time a kid comes up to my office and just wants to chat or watch some film, I just remind them, man, be a good teammate. You know, all, all the guys that, you know, you interact with on a daily basis. Um, and I always encourage it during a game, middle of a game, um, just be a good teammate. Help your teammate. Great, great, great phrase right there. Um, what's the uh, best piece of advice you've ever been given? I would say um, just some advice I probably got at a young age from, from my mother. Just uh, treat people how you want to be treated. And, uh, you know, I just try to follow that, you know, put yourself, try to put yourself in other people's shoes. So, um, yeah, just, you know, um, uh, treat people how you want to be treated. Simple and sweet, man. It's, it's powerful though. That's what people don't get. Um, like delete, what does success mean to you? I think success is, is, is just so, such a, it's such a unique question. Yeah. I don't know if anyone's ever asked me that, but I think success is being happy, trying to figure out what makes you happy. Um, some people are having tangible goods or having a lot of money makes them happy. Um, for me, it's, it's, you know, just being in an environment on a daily basis would be good people. Um, and just, being, being in, in a place in life where you can help other people. Um, I think that's the reason, you know, I got into coaching. I think so many people helped me when I was a younger kid um, and steered me in the right directions. So for me, you know, being happy is just seeing other people succeed, um, especially the, the, the players that you coach. Um, but I think just having a, a, a peace of mind on a daily basis as I've grown older and more mature as a person. I think just having a peace of mind, you know, provides you a certain level of happiness. And I think that that happiness, you know, will will, will lead to success over time. Great, great. I, I love that. I don't um, know if that's the answer you were looking for, but that's actually a perfect answer. I, I, I mean, I love that. Um, you're not a self promoter. You've never been one. Um, I've been around you for years now you never talk about yourself um you let your work speak for itself um but if you had to choose three adjectives to describe yourself which would you choose um say passionate um uh, loyal and um determined Love it. Three great ones that actually describe you to a T. Um, what person and or event has had the most influence on your life? Ooh. Uh, I'd have to say just uh, it, it, the event. I think it's, it's a combination event, person. Um, my, my mother passed away from brain cancer when I was uh, 20 years old. I was a junior in college. So that just had a monumental effect uh, on my life. But, um, you know, I learned to be grateful that I was, I was able to have a, a supportive mother in my life for 20 years. And, you know, some kids don't have that for at all. So uh, that, that, that event just made me grow up very quickly. I think, uh, 
it helped me mature a lot quicker to realize, you know, um, can't call home and ask mom what to do, you know. So um, just grateful, to be honest, because um, when I was, I th believe, I think I was uh, around 10 or 11 years old, I forget, you know, to be honest, uh, the, the, when you're a young child, you forget the ages and events. But my mother had a scare with breast cancer, and um, I remember how scared she was. And I was so scared when I found out because I was afraid I was going to lose a parent. But I I'm just so grateful that, you know, God God got, got us through those circumstances and allowed me to have uh, a, a great mother for 20 years as opposed to 10 or 11. Um, so that, that, that event just shaped my life. It, it taught me to be grateful for everything that you have. And uh, it made me grow up, Lamar, to be honest with you. Um, it made me grow up fast and, and um, taught me how to be independent and, and make decisions, you know, as an, as an adult. Um, so that, that I, I would go with that event, you know, changed my life. Well, I'm going to say you, I'm sure you've made her proud and, um, you know, she did a great job for you and you follow her. You can tell, like, you listen to her, you follow everything she's done and, I'm sure not only, you know, everyone in the family is proud and they, they see that. And like, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy for you. And, you know, that's something I didn't know, but right. you can see, you can see all of it when it comes out of you, how, how happy you were for her and, you know, how, 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 you, you know, you did everything that she wanted you to do from a standpoint of, you know, being happy and being successful and that, that stuff. So I'm, I'm happy to, I'm happy you shared that moment with, uh, with me on 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 um, on this on this podcast, um, how has coaching affected your life? Um, and, and any specific way, you know? Um, no, like I mean, just like you know, like you you were a guy who was probably could have made tons of money, like if you would have stayed at the Lord, but like you chose your passion, what you went after, but like. How has it affected your life, like, in a in a great way, or especially you, you chased a dream you wanted to do eventually? So, sure. how has it affected your life? I think, I think you realize the impact that you can make on young people, um, that can have a monumental effect on on people who, and you don't even know you're you're having that that change, right? And sometimes for a seventeen to twenty three year old young men that 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 moment that that light bulb clicks on them when they're in their late twenties or early thirties. And I think just hearing from the players you coached um, earlier in, in, in your career and to see the wonderful things that they're doing in life. Um, and when they call just to say, thanks for, for helping me get through so many different situations during my playing career. Um, I think that, that that's a great feeling that you, you had an impact on somebody's life. And like I said to you earlier, Lamar, like I, I'm grateful that there's so many people who made an impact on my life when I was a kid. Uh, I was a brat as a kid. Um, so, I mean, I, di I didn't grow up with many tangible things, but um, I know I wasn't an easy kid to deal with probably. Um, but uh, there are so many people that made an impact on my life. And that's the reason I got into coaching, you know, just to be able to, to do the same for somebody else. And, and you hope that, you know, through your years of coaching, you can, you can help other young men. And uh, I think that's what's brought, that's what it's brought out of me is just realizing that you don't know the impact that you're having on people. And even down, down the years when, when 17 to 23 year old kids get older and they call you and, um, I won't name a name. I won't name the person, but I still think there's one kid that uses me as his emergency contact when he fills out any form. And I told him, I think it's time to stop. So, uh, I think he's, he's actually getting married soon. So I'm excited that he's able to put his wife down as his emergency contact moving forward. But you know, that, that just that story, you know, and, uh, kids memorizing your cell phone numbers because if they're ever in a jam they they want to call you and I'm like you take that um with a certain level of humility and pride that people value the relationship as a coach and 
and player uh, for all the years that, you know, after they leave campus. So um, I think that's the effect that uh, it's had on me as coaching and, and, you know, to all the young coaches out there who are trying to break in, don't, don't underestimate the value of the word coach and what it means. I love that, man. So, I mean, yeah, you talked about it, like kids just reaching back out or having you, you know, they want you to be a part of their life, even as an adult. That, that stuff is huge. They're calling you when they're making the biggest decisions. And that stuff, that tells you how much you've affected their lives uh, or, you know, through those most important times, uh, like you said, 17 to 23, when they have to make decisions, they learn how to, they go from young boy to man, and, and that tells you a lot how much you affected their life. Um, knowing what you know now, because you've been in this for a while, it don't seem like it, but it has been a while. Like, what, what would you tell your young self or your younger self to prepare for as an assistant coach? Um, I would tell them to find a show like Lamar's Platform to help them understand what they're getting themselves into. Uh, no, I, I think – um, you wish that you, you know, the one thing I wish I w would have done more of is just reach out more to people to understand, you know, what, what, what you're getting yourself into and, um, don't try to figure out all the, the problems by yourself, you know, reach out. Um, don't be hard headed, I guess I would say, um, it's okay to ask for help. You know, there, all these circumstances that, you probably encounter somebody else's face, right? So um, I would say probably just reach out more to people to understand how they navigate through certain circumstances as opposed to just trying to figure everything out. You know, um, you can learn, like I said earlier, you can learn from everybody, you know, regardless of age, sex, race, ethnicity. So, um, Try to try to try to reach out and learn from everybody that you work with in the office, on a campus, in the community. You know, from your players. Just uh, we all we all have an opportunity to not only impact other people but learn from other people. So, yes, sir, you're right. You're 100 percent right. Well, look, man, Delete, man. I want to thank you again for being a guest on the show and being unmasked. Is there anything you might want to leave leave with the people before we go? So sure, Lamar, thanks. Thanks so much for having me on your platform. I think uh, you're doing a wonderful job for um, not only getting uh, people's stories out and, and, and who they are as people, but I think you're helping younger coaches in our profession. Maybe they're at the start of their career or, or they haven't gotten in yet. And I hope they utilize your platform to learn. Um, but, you know, the only, and, and like I said, I appreciate your friendship over the years. I'm glad we have so many strong mutual friends that, you know, um, that we've been able to spend time together and grow our own friendship. So I just wanted to say I appreciate you, um, you know, for that. But uh, the only thing I, I, I'd say is, and for anyone, you know, I don't know how many views this is going to get, but uh, I hope that anyone who watches, you know, this, this platform by Lamar and in today's uh, time, today's times in, in the world, that, you know, we all, we all take a step back and, you know, put yourself in other people's shoes without judging them. I think it's just a strong, strong world we live in. Um, don't judge a book by its cover, you know. Um, so if we can all just take a step back and not be so reactive and uh, just try to encourage other people put yourself in another person's shoes um, before, before, you know, coming up with your viewpoint on a situation because you, you don't know another person's viewpoint. Um, and the only other thing I'd say is for anyone who, who, who's in a position to help somebody do it. Um, you know, God, God gave everybody a unique set of skills and, and uh, attributes in life. And if, if he gave you an attribute to help somebody, do it. Because that's why that's why he gave it to you. Well, look, man, I appreciate that dropping more nuggets at the end. Uh, 
you're welcome for coming on the show. And, and I want to thank you for those kind words uh, that you said. And um, you know, like I said, I appreciate your friendship over the years. And uh, I know you'll continue to do big things. And, and I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, seeing you not, not, not in the near future, but down the road as well. And so I want to thank you viewers for watching another great show. Stay tuned for the next guest as we get them unmasked. See you next time and stay safe.